Kenny Gardner is a 1979 graduate of Brown Trail School of Preaching. He served as a medic in the U.S. Army. He graduated from Texas A&M University, bachelor's degree in education, and later from East Texas State University with a master's degree in history. He has preached in Wisconsin as well as in Talco, Texas, and he has been in Plano, Texas since 1991, where he also now has served as an elder for several years. Beginning in 2004, he has been an instructor here at the school, and we're very thankful for that. It's been a great opportunity for me uh, to get to know Kenny better and to be able to work with him, and it's been a joy and so, uh, so thankful for what he contributes at the schools. I know the students can attest to as well. He and his wife, Belinda, have three sons and five grandchildren, and we see some here, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for Brother Kenny and his willingness to address, again, a very difficult subject, when two become one, coping with the loss of a spouse. Brother Kenny. I don't know that I've ever preached any other sermon that's given me as much trouble trying to prepare. If there's ever been a sermon that uh, even now I really don't know how to present my thoughts, a sermon that I'm uncomfortable preaching, it would have to be this sermon. I'm uncomfortable talking about these things because these are things I don't even want to think about, much less discuss at some length with others. Uh, I wanted my wife to be here because I wanted her to meet some of the students and some of the students to meet her, but uh, I don't know it makes me more uncomfortable with uh, her here. I'm uncomfortable talking about these things because this is something I have never experienced myself, and it just makes me feel a bit presumptuous to talk about things that I have never experienced and others have. I can only talk about these things from things that I've read, things I've heard other people say, and observations that I've made as I've seen others pass away, as I've observed their, their family and loved ones, and I've, as I've seen others approach the end of their lives knowing that they're dying. And so I'm uncomfortable talking about these things, but I'm convinced that these are things we do need to talk about because it's going to happen. In a way, it's going to happen to all of us. Either you're going to die or your spouse is going to die. We grow up and most of us get married and all of us die, but very, very seldom do couples die together. Uh, sometimes they do in accidents. I heard recently about an elderly couple in a nursing home who died together. Caregivers had moved their beds together and they died together holding hands. But that doesn't happen very often. In fact, it's so rare that it is newsworthy. And even if the surviving spouse survives for a short period of time, a few days, a few weeks, that short period of time is still a time of deep sorrow. And so we can look at one another today, our husbands, our wives, and say, either I'm going to attend your funeral or you're going to attend mine. In all likelihood, that's the way it's going to be. So I think this is something that we do need to talk about. I think we need to talk about it because it's so, I can only imagine how devastating it would be. It's hard enough to lose any family member, anyone close to us, a parent, or even more tragically, I can only imagine how devastating it would be to lose a child. But to lose your spouse, God says something about the husband and wife relationship that he doesn't say about any other human relationship. You know, it's in the title of the lesson, to become one. Man and a woman marry, they become one. And so when your spouse dies, 
a part of you dies. And again, I can only imagine how devastating that must be. I know how devastating it was for my dad when mom passed away. I remember sitting right there on that second pew beside him and we listened as Ed Clark and Eddie Whitten and David Miller talked about mom. And I don't remember much of what was said. Ed and Eddie were close to mom and dad and they kept talking about what a good woman she was. They said it over and over and I thought, well, you don't know the half of it. It's a far better woman than you know, even though you were close to her. But I do well remember what Dave Miller said. He didn't know mom, he had just come here. And he got up and he quoted Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord that their works may follow them. And he also quoted Psalm 116 and verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And then he sat down. That's all he said, two passages of scripture. But I'll never forget those two passages of scripture and his saying them at my mother's funeral. But I remember how devastating it was for dad I still remember we just happened to be spending the night at mom and dad's house here in Bedford. And uh, it, was, it was midnight. I still remember dad running down the hallway, Kenny, Kenny, your mother's having a heart attack. So the paramedics came and they worked on her there at the house. And then they took her to the ambulance, they worked on her there. And then they took her to the hospital. And the doctors there worked on her for an hour or two, seemed like forever. And I think we always already knew what was happening. I'm convinced she died there in the house. But we sat there in the waiting room and cried. And when my sister arrived, she asked, of course, what's going on? How's mom? And I couldn't speak. I don't guess any of us could speak. The words just wouldn't come out. And so she died that morning about 2 o'clock in the morning. And then all day Saturday, family and friends came to the house and visited with us and we appreciated their visits and their words of consolation so very much. And uh, those who couldn't come phoned. There was a lady in Dallas, an interior decorator that mom and dad had worked with for years, probably since they first started their business. And she called, the phone was given to dad and as soon as he heard her voice, he couldn't speak. He just burst out crying again. So I know how devastating it was for dad and for all of us. I remember how shocked I was simply that she died. She had heart problems and had not been in the best of health for a couple of years, several hospital visits, a heart attack or two, always carried nitroglycerin with her for chest pains and yet it never crossed my mind that she would die. How could I have been so clueless? But uh, I was shocked that she died, and I was shocked that it hurt so bad. And I was shocked that I cried so much. The tears just would not stop. I didn't know the human body could shed that many tears. So I know something about how devastating it is to, to lose a loved one. There's a preacher in this area who lost his wife well, a few months ago and he posts on Facebook about her and about times he spent, all the times they had together and he talks about his own sorrow, his own grief. And I commented here last week, I appreciate him talking about his grief. I hope it helps him to talk about his grief I think it helps us. It helps us to share and console with him. And I think also about uh, Abraham. It seems like every funeral I preach, I talk about Abraham losing Sarah. And the Bible not only tells us that he mourned for Sarah, but that he also wept for Sarah. And they were both old. Even for that day and age, they were old. And I think old people shouldn't have to cry. You know, kids cry. Kids don't get their way, and they stumble and skin their knees, and kids cry. But you grow up, and you don't cry anymore. 
but I suspect most of us have shed more tears as adults than we ever did as kids. And here Abraham is mourning and weeping for Sarah, and they had grown up together. They were half brother and sister, and I can't help but wonder what that must have been like growing up. They had the same father, different mothers, and I wonder perhaps they might have lived in different households, perhaps some distance from one another, perhaps they were more like cousins. But I suspect more likely they grew up together in the same house, like brother and sister. And I wonder if she wasn't uh, that annoying little sister that was always hanging around. Uh, I wonder if when she was born, someone didn't say to 10-year-old Abram, Abram, would you like to hold your new baby sister? Oh, I, I guess so, yes, that'd be fine. Uh, and when was it, when they were growing up together, that he began to see her not as an annoying little sister, but as a, a woman that he might want to marry one day? But there was hardly any time in his life when he did not know Sarah. You talk about the love of one's life. And now she's gone. And here's this old man weeping and mourning for his wife. And I feel like that when he purchased that field with a cave in it that would make a good burial place, that field from Ephron there in Machpelah, I felt he probably thought that he was going to follow his wife to the grave pretty shortly. But he didn't live for nearly another 40 years, remarried and had other children. But I think about this old man who's mourning and weeping for, for his wife, the love of his life that he had known all of his life. And I think it's important for us to talk about these things because, because I think there's a misunderstanding about grief and about what I'm going to call heart pain. Uh, we talked about, or Tommy so well talked about agony that many of us go through and all of us have have had at least a taste of sadness and gloom and sorrow in our lives for whatever reason but I think we misunderstand we're children of God we have the peace that passes understanding we know that God loves us and cares for us and I think sometimes we leave the impression, maybe we get the impression ourselves that we should never be sad. And that we should pray and that God will comfort us and whatever heartache we have will go away. Well, no, I think that's a misunderstanding of what God is revealing to us in the pages of the Bible. Because grief and sorrow and heartache and regret because of things we've done or because of things that have happened to us, they're just not going to go away overnight. And again, all of us have had at least a taste of this. We do things that we shouldn't have done. We fail to do things that we should do. We have regret and we have sorrow in our lives and bad things happen to us. Uh, our loved ones pass away. And we ourselves or a family member, gets, we get bad news from the doctor. We were involved in car accident, houses burned down, and we fail. We fail at school and we fail at our jobs and we fail in our family, personal relationships with one another, with people we love, and we have regrets and we have sorrow, we have gloom. We have heaviness, we have depression in our lives, and we think if we pray about it and we study our Bibles, that we, we look for some sort of remedy that will make it all go away. But the comfort we receive from God and from the Bible and from one another is really not the comfort that we want. We want it all to go away. We want the pain to leave us, and it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight is going to be with us for a while. See, when heartache comes into our house, it doesn't knock on the door, it knocks the door down. And it comes up and it takes residence in our house. And there's not much we can do about it. And we can't clench our fists, we can't grit our teeth, we can't squint our eyes and frown and threaten and make the pain go away. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. We're going to talk about the comfort we receive from God. By all means, that comfort is real. But the pain and the heartache that comes from the things we do and fail to do and the bad things that happen to us, just not going to leave us overnight. And when things like this, I'm not going to tell you that I have failed and failed and failed and failed time and time again. And I'm not going to tell you that I've suffered more than others. That, that would be a lie, a big lie. Because there are so many, many people who have suffered so very, very much. But all of us have a taste of what I'm talking about here. And more than one or two or three or four times has happened in my life. And when it happens to me, I simply tell myself, Kenny, you're in for an ordeal. And this, this gloominess that you have is not going to go away overnight. It's going to be there for a while. And there's not much you can do about it except endure it. You see, we can't, we can't deal with sorrow. We can't negotiate with it. We can't tell it to go away. It's just a feeling, and it's there with us. And it will taper off eventually, but it's not going to do it today or tomorrow or next week. The kind of agony that parents have when their children are unfaithful, you know, it just doesn't go away. We just can't turn it off. And we simply have to endure it and survive it. And we can do that with help from one another and with help from God and with help from knowing God's word. But I think it's wrong for us to look for immediate relief because it's not going to happen. It didn't happen in the Bible. You know, did David, the regret that David must have had for what he had done, how could he live with himself because of committing adultery and murder? A good, decent, honorable, brave man died because of David's treachery? How could David live with himself after what he had done? God forgave him, and I suspect he eventually forgave himself. But that heartache, that pain stayed with him for a long, long time. I don't know that Esau is a very good example for us to consider because he brought his suffering on himself, and he didn't deal with his suffering appropriately and rightly. But nonetheless, he was in agony, and he sought. He could not find a place of repentance he could not find a chance to repent. He could not bring about a change of mind. There's some things I don't understand about that passage. But he sought it. The Bible tells us he sought it. Maybe the blessing he sought. He sought it carefully. He sought it diligently with tears, with bitter tears. And I think we can relate to that kind of sadness. And it eventually tapered off. But it took a long time. And what about... Uh, what about the Apostle Paul and the regret he felt for trying to, spending so many years trying to destroy the church? And other examples could be given as well. Peter, the regret that he must have had for denying his Lord. Job, you know, eventually the suffering for Job went away, but it didn't go away overnight. He had to endure it. And likewise, Jesus himself praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Matthew tells us that Jesus began, as he prayed, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. He even told the disciples, my soul, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. D.R. Dungan in his book on hermeneutics says that if that angel that God sent had not come there to strengthen him, he would have died. That speculation, he would have died that night there in the Garden of Gethsemane if God had not sent an angel to strengthen him. But what God didn't do was send a legion of angels to fight the Roman soldiers and prevent his crucifixion. And like us, we're going to have to endure some pain in our lives and some heartache in our lives and it's not something that we can just wish away or just turn off, and it doesn't go away immediately. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that's what we should want. You know, there's an interesting passage that's found in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I know that we have to be careful when we study books like Ecclesiastes, 
But I think what the writer there is saying is true, perhaps within limits. But he says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 that it is better, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting because that is the end of all men. The NIV says that death is the destiny of everyone. And the living should take this to heart. The living should lay this to heart. It is not morbid for us to reflect upon the brevity of life. It's good for us. It will help us to be better people. It will cause us to focus on what's really important in life. And so we should reflect upon the brevity of life. But he's not finished there in Ecclesiastes 7. He actually says that sorrow is better than laughter. And he says, by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. A sad face, again, the NIV says, is good for the heart. And finally, he concludes, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth or pleasure. And so the sorrow should help us to turn to God and to seek comfort and relief from him. But the hurt stays with us. The hurt stays with us for a while. It eventually tapers off. But for us to wish for it all to go away, for us to wish that it's a nightmare that we're going to wake up from and it'll all be back the way it was, it's just not going to happen. And I think that's an important understanding. So the pain is real, but God's comfort is real as well. And I think we need to reassure ourselves of that. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27. A.J. Showalter, a gospel preacher, received two letters, a letter from two of former students. And both of those men had recently lost their wives. And he wrote back to them, and he reminded them of this very passage. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And then he wrote the words of the song that we often sing, leaning on the everlasting arms. So we should take comfort, and we can take comfort from what God tells us. Again, Psalm 116 and verse 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. In Revelation 14 and verse 13, Blessed are those who die in the Lord, they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord, and he delivers them, Psalm 34 and verse 7. And the Lord is near those who call upon him. Psalm 145 and verse 18. The Lord is near those who call on him in truth. And Psalm 56 and verse 8, which Tommy mentioned earlier, God has a tear bottle for each one of us, and he collects our tears. He knows the number of hairs on our heads, and he knows the number of tears that each one of us has shed. Our God is a compassionate God. Isaiah 43 and verse 2. Through the prophet, God said, I'll be with you when you pass through the waters, when you pass through the rivers. And I think he's at least including rivers of adversity and hardship and difficulty and sorrow and grief. And when you pass through the waters and the rivers of grief, I'll be with you. And when you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The flame will not consume you. And likewise in Isaiah, Isaiah 66 and verse 13, God says, I will comfort you the way a mother comforts her child. And so we serve a compassionate God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we might be able to comfort others with the comfort with which God comforts us. And also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we know, he says there, we know that when our earthly house, our earthly tabernacle, this tent that we live in, we know when it dissolves, we know when it is destroyed, that we have a building. We have a building of God, not made with hands, not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. In Romans chapter 8, what shall separate us from the love of God? I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing should be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And finally, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul tells us there that 
our Savior, our Savior Jesus Christ has abolished death. Well, you wouldn't think so. We all drove past a few funeral homes on our way to get here today. We're still going to funerals. And yet Paul says that Christ has abolished death. And truly he has because we're going to be resurrected. And we know that for a fact because God resurrected Jesus. So our Savior has abolished death and he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And so again, our God, the comfort we receive from our God is real. But make no mistake about it, the pain, the heartache, the sorrow, the grief that we all experience in our lives, it's real. And we, we can't wish it away. We didn't ask for it. We didn't invite it into our lives. You can't tell me, Kenny, just, just lighten up. Don't be so hard on yourself. I didn't ask for this feeling, but it came uninvited, and I don't want it, and I know it'll go away, but I tell myself, Kenny, you're in for an ordeal. It's not going to go away overnight, but you can survive it. But you have responsibilities that you need to fulfill. And sometimes I feel like I'm just going through the motions. But I have responsibilities that I have to fulfill. And I know that eventually, whatever heartache, whatever sadness comes into my life, I know that eventually it will taper off. May God bless our efforts to trust him and to trust his providence, his providential care. And may God bless our feeble, so very, very feeble efforts to serve him and to honor him. It struck me some this weekend when men will get up and begin with a statement of great humility about covering their subject and then to speak so beautifully about it. Maybe not knowing in that very specific way, Kenny, to have that experience and yet to have addressed it, I think in a way that was comforting and that was touching. I appreciate that. I think he established the hardest thing, which is there's not some specific way you prepare. And that accepting it is going to be the hard thing. But that it can come with God's help. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. I know when I look out the students and you hear lessons Today, they seem a long way off in application, and hopefully they are for you, personally. But these are subjects that people deal with on a daily basis in congregations in life, and that's why it's important for us to know about them. We have now opportunity to take a break, stretch, get some rest. And Kenny has graciously granted us time so that we are not rushed. But you have time to look. And remember, I want to remind you again about the offer that WVBS has extended to you to pick up one per household DVD or book at their display. But also take the time to register and, and to uh, get more familiar with that work if you're not already. Uh, you can talk to John Warns uh, more about that um, and find more about that if you want as well. He is here. We have, of course, the meal prepared. We need to know more about that and uh, get that count back. I hope that you can stay. We're going to talk a little bit about the school, hopefully not too much, uh, but uh, something that will be enjoyable and, and just catch you up. Tomorrow, our normal times of meeting here at Brown Trail have three lessons. Kevin Kane. At 9 o'clock, when Jesus dropped by. 
Then we'll have a lesson on God's family at 10 o'clock. And uh, I will be giving that lesson in, uh, instead of Eddie this time. And then tomorrow night, Bill Burke, God Give Us Christian Homes. These three are big picture uh, items for the home to kind of cap off the specifics we've discussed here uh, this weekend. We know that some of you have other congregations, other obligations. We understand that, but we'd still love to have you join us if you could. We're thankful for the work of the congregation, for the uh, members who have helped us throughout, and we appreciate your being with us. And uh, hopefully we can, you can take some of these things and really make a difference in how you approach things, people, and most of all, approach God and see him in your own life. This time, would you please stand? Let us pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful that in the heartaches, the challenges, the difficulties, the setbacks, our fears, our sorrows in life, that you are with us. In the challenges of loss, spiritual and physical, but we have a God who cares. And we're thankful, Father, that we can lean on you through these kind of times. As we reflect on the fact that they are always there, that this is part of being human, and that these are always lurking around us. But we give thanks to you, Father, for the victory that Jesus achieved so that we might have hope. We're thankful for all the lessons that we have heard and that we still have an opportunity to hear. We're thankful for what these men have studied, for their quality in, in presentation and how they have touched and enriched us. And we pray for the congregations where they are serving, for their works, that it might be of great benefit moving forward in the brotherhood. We pray, Father, that we, through what we gain, might be a blessing to others, that we can reflect on some of these things, be strengthened, be better prepared, and be ready to recognize the challenges others are going through with, with loving hearts and a willingness to listen and care. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to train preachers, for the support that makes that possible, for the good that is done through the efforts for years to come. And we thank you, Father, for the great love you've shown us that gives us life, not only physically, but spiritually, and hope eternally. Bless us now, Father, as we close and this time, we're thankful for food to eat, for the work that's been done to make that possible. And we're thankful, Father, for time just with one another as we rest and consider and reflect. And we remember the beauty that we have approaching of a day to remember our Lord and the great sacrifice that makes a beauty and joy in life possible. Please forgive us of our sins. Keep us all safe, Father, as we travel to our homes. And bless the congregations where we are that we might be the light we should be. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.